welcome all to the Thursday evening Nantasket Beach Lecture Series uh, put on by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Friends of the Hull Public Library, and the Hull Life Saving Museum. Um, as many of you know, I know a, a lot of familiar faces. We have uh, desserts, and instead of coffee today, because it's so hot, summer came one day early, we have some iced tea and lemonade in the back. So please um, help yourself. And all of the donations from um, this program or the donations that we collect from this program goes to pay towards future speakers and to keep buying you delicious desserts. So um, your, your donations are graciously appreciated. So um, I also wanted to thank the Nantasket Beach Resort for hosting us here. Um, we used to have it at the bathhouse and we didn't have AC. So on this particular night, it's uh, especially nice to have a nice cool breeze up here. Um, I also wanted to thank Hull Cable Access Television, who tapes all of our events. So if you had a, a couple of friends or family members that couldn't make it to this evening's lecture, Hull Cable Access has a YouTube channel, and they post all of their lectures up to that site. So you can check that out. Tonight's speaker. Tonight we are honored to welcome Barbara Bailey. Barbara started with the New England Aquarium in 1985 as the assistant purchasing agent before becoming a curatorial assistant for the aquarium and then later an Aquarius in 1989. Later she became the husbandry operations manager before her current role as the husbandry assistant curator at the New England Aquarium's animal care facility in Quincy. The facility itself is home to all classifications of animals from invertebrates to marine mammals, as well as rescued and rehabilitated sea turtles. Barbara works on the husbandry side of the facility with everything from invertebrates to marine mam mammals and preparing new animals for their exhibit in the New England Aquarium in downtown Boston. Tonight we have a special opportunity to learn more about this facility and what it takes to prepare new species for aquarium exhibits in Boston. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Bailey. So I think I'm going to have to hold the microphone because I have a very soft voice, so if you can't hear me, just shout out. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk about the um, animal, care, animal Care Center in Quincy. Um, as uh, Jessica said, um, I've been with the aquarium since 1985 in various positions, but now spend the majority of my time at the Animal Care Center in Quincy. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about some of the work we do there. Um, so many of you in the audience probably know a lot more about the Four River Shipyard than I do, but I'm just going to give a really brief history of the shipyard because I think it's important. Um, it has a very um, long history. It was um, started in the uh, 1760s. And in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1883, um, Thomas Watson founded the Four River Engine Company and built some of the ships you see here um, on the screen, including um, some of the first submarines and also the Thomas W. Lawson, which was the um, only seven-masted steel hull um, schooner of its type. In 1913 to 1964, the shipyard was home to Bethlehem Steel, and during that time they built some seven aircraft carriers, three battleships, 30-plus cruisers, 60 destroyers. They employed 32,000 workers, sometimes three shifts a day, and they had a record for destroyer production um, at 39 days. And it was also an economic boom to the South Shore communities. Um, in 1964 to 1986, General Dynamics um, occupied the shipyard and focused mainly on the um, production of LNG tankers. They built 12 tankers there. They were 900 feet long, and all 12 are still in operation today. And in 2004, the shipyard, um, various parcels in the shipyard were bought by um, Quirk Chevrolet and um, Cashman Marine Enterprises. And soon after that, um, tenants followed, including MIT uh, Bluefin Robotics and the New England Aquarium Animal Care Center. So we looked at a lot of other um, off-site facilities, um, but in December of 2009, we signed the lease with um, Cashman Enterprises. Um, it didn't look like much from the outside, but on the inside, the potential was endless. Um, what made this site unique um, was not only the cost uh, to lease it, but also some of these assets you see here up on the screen, with the two most important things being clean seawater and proximity to sea turtle strandings, which happen on the Cape. Um, the last one here hosts Boston Harbor Ferry Service. 
that was very attractive to us, but that's no longer <laughs> happening in Quincy. So it's making it challenging for us to get back and forth from Quincy to Boston. So in early um, 2010, we started renovations. Um, we dismantled the old offices and workspaces. We um, dug up the slab um, to drive piles to support the weight of the tanks when filled with water. And that left piles of contaminated soil um, with lead that we needed to truck off site and dispose of properly. Um, <clears throat> we laid pipe under the ground in trenches. Um, by the way, I have a shark stick here that I'm going to use as a pointer. <laughs> um, so these are the, the pipes that we laid um, in trenches. Um, and the uh, work was not limited to the inside of the building. On the outside of the building, we also drug, dug trenches for our seawater system. We get our water from the four 700 river. feet into the building, and it's treated um, through life support. It, goes, um, it, get o it gets ozonated and also um, heated to desired temperature, and that's what we use in our tanks. And then water that leaves the building through backwashes or tank drainings also goes back to the Four River, but it's treated with a very sophisticated uh, discharge system that includes um, mechanical filtration, um, ozonation, carbon, um, and that's mandated by the EPA and DEP. So the water we bring in is actually cleaner when it goes back out to the river. Um, and that's Charlie, me and Charlie, our head vet, marking our territory there. Unfortunately, that's under about 200,000 pounds of water under the 30-foot uh, tank. So soon after, um, life support equipment began arriving um, and was staged out in the parking lot. Um, we, we brought the equipment into the building um, with a lull, strapping, and lots of ingenuity. It was very heavy. Um, and it was like a game of chess. The pieces were brought in and moved around on the floor to, to find out where it would work. We needed to leave spaces um, for walkways to get to the equipment. Um, and this picture here is before, and this is after, with all the pipe connected. Um, when it was all said and done, we had over 123,000 gallons of water and 800 valves dedicated just to life support. And I'm still working on the uh, miles of pipe, and I think I'll give that to an intern to figure out. So this is um, a picture of arrival of our 30-foot diameter tank. This tank is the workhorse in Quincy. Um, it's 30 feet in diameter by 6 feet deep, and it was trucked all the way across the country from California on a flatbed truck in 16 pieces. And it was taken off the truck with a lull and put on dollies, rolled into the building. We didn't have a forklift. And, um, was put together like a puzzle on the concrete pad and then fiberglass together. And this has been um, a great tank. It's enabled us to um, hold a various numbers of um, Elasmobranch species, including multiple species at a time. This is an aerial, aerial view that was taken um, from a mezzanine, which is a small platform that came with the building, but it's since been expanded to include life support um, for the oval tank you see down here on the bottom, and then a, another oval tank. So we actually ran out of space on the floor and we had to go up higher um, for some of the equipment. One of the last pieces of construction uh, we called the Penguin Palace. Um, it's actually a 25 foot long by 15 foot oval tank, but we enclosed it in its own structure. Um, and it was a state of the art uh, construction with um, special lighting, HVAC, HEPA filters, and it was also pressurized to keep mosquitoes out when the penguins were, were in the uh, enclosure. And some other additional Quincy essentials is our quarantine room. Um, this picture here is before the room was finished. Um, that's phase one. It's now completed. It has um, 10 separate systems um, totaling over 8,000 gallons of water. Um, and this is our food prep room or kitchen area where we prepare food every day for the, the animals we're caring for. And the picture on the bottom, we called the coral room, but we're slowly transitioning that room into a live food culture and a room to um, raise larval fishes in. And really the heart of um, the animal care center is the laboratory. Um, we have a um, diagnostic equipment there, water quality is done there, we have a small surgery table. Um, this is a spade fish that we're actually 
uh, is under anesthesia and we're removing a growth that it had. And we have an x-ray room as well. And of course, rescue re and rehabilitation is also at the Animal Care Center and it's their permanent home now. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, rescue rehab later in the presentation. So this facility was a facility that um, many longtime staff members, including myself, have dreamed of for many years. Um, and it would allow us to do some really critical functions that we were not able to do in Boston just due to the space restrictions. So the primary um, functions of this uh, animal care center are, are to prepare new exhibits for opening. Um, we're able to bring species in early and work with them before the exhibit opens. We're able to quarantine new animals. We're able to hold and grow out animals. And it's also home to um, rescue and rehab. So as I said, one of the um, critical functions is to prepare exhibits for opening. Um, some of the first residents we had were 76 cow nose rays that were collected in uh, the Chesapeake in um, 2010. And initially we held them in our uh, Duxbury offsite facility, which we no longer use. And they came up to Quincy in November and spent four to five months in the 30-foot um, oval tank, or round tank that I showed you. And once they were done with quarantine, they went to our Shark and Ray touch exhibit in April 2011. So this is something we wouldn't have been able to do in Boston. But the driving force behind securing the Animal Care Center was the uh, giant ocean tank renovation last year. Um, uh, Quincy enabled us to bring in new species and work with them before the exhibit opened. It also allowed us to quarantine all the new animals that would be going into the exhibit, as well as provide a home to the penguins and um, some other fishes that came to Quincy for holding. And uh, one of the animals that we worked with that were, was very exciting was new shark species. Um, this is a black nose shark. Um, and I'll just go over a few things about the black nose shark. It gets um, four feet, six inches maximum total length. It's a fast growing species, reaching maturity in two years. It's found in the Western Atlantic from South Carolina to Southern Brazil, including Caribbean Sea, Bahamas, and Gulf of Mexico. It gives live birth, 10 to 11 months gestation period, and typically four pups. They segregate by sex and size. And juveniles are found in shallow water. Adults are located at greater depths and they often form large schools and are, are associated with mullet or anchovies. And the, um, their common name, black nose, is from a little black spot they have on their nose. And another, another species we'd be working with is bonnethead sharks. Um, they're the smallest member of the hammerhead family, and they're found in tropical waters of western Atlantic to Brazil, Caribbean Sea, Cuba, and Bahamas. They give live birth, four to five months gestation, and four to 12 pups. And they're found on continental insular shelves over reef, estuaries, and shallow bays. And they can form large groups, um, especially during migration periods of hundreds or even thousands. And they travel long distances every day following changes in water temperature. So we learned a lot about these um, two sharks while preparing them for the giant ocean tank renovation. We developed diet and feeding strategies and schedules. We transitioned from broadcast feedings, which is just throwing the food in the water, to actually feeding them on a stick like this, with divers in the water. Um, we introduced other species to the holding tank, including cow nose rays, southern rays, spadefish, trunkfish. And um, we also introduced a variety of habitats for them. Um, we would change up the currents um, in the tank to get them to change uh, swimming patterns. And we learned a lot about their behaviors that are unique to these sharks. One of the things that we do with the sharks is uh, to conduct medical procedures. So just like you, going to your doctor for a checkup, we do that with all our animals. They get a wellness exam. Um, and how we do that with sharks is actually um, use a kiddie pool this is an inflatable 80-inch kiddie pool that kids like to use in their backyard. Um, and it's a, a well-orchestrated event that happens between um, my, my team and the animal health department. Um, and we take the shark uh, and put it in the kiddie pool here. 
and it's anesthetized here, and it goes to sleep. And once it's asleep, we move it to um, the exam table. And we've been able to successfully conduct um, exams on both our black nose and bonnet head sharks that include ultrasound, blood draws, and endoscopies. Um, while the shark is asleep, you need to keep it asleep, and to do that, we, had, um, we have a tube that's attached to a small pump, and water is passed over the shark's gills um, that has high oxygen content, and it's also um, dosed with anesthesia. And once the exam is done, the shark is then placed in another kiddie pool that's floating on the surface of its holding tank. And the water in the kiddie pool is just regular tank water and it slowly comes out of anesthesia. And when it's awake and, and able to swim normally, we can release it back into the tank. This is an additional use um, <laughs> that, for our kiddie pool. So. Um, uh, these exams are really stressful for staff, too. <laughs> so uh, this is Monica just kind of floating in the kiddie pool. Just a margarita, and she'd be happy. So um, another thing we needed to do um, was to actually transport the sharks once they were ready for um, exhibit. So Quincy is 20 minutes away from Boston, and we needed to be able to get them there. So <clears throat> to capture them is actually quite easy. Um, it's two divers in scuba with rubber nets. And once you get to work with these sharks um, long enough, you understand their swimming patterns with divers in the water, and it's actually pretty simple to catch them. Um, you just don't want to chase them. They kind of wait till they come around and you get under them, and they swim right into the net. So that's the net right there, and that's a shark, and that's a diver. So that's how we collect them. Um, and once they're collected, um, we put them in the specialized bonnet, uh, black nose tank here on the left. This tank is specially designed for black nose sharks. Um, and when, when it's filled with water all the way up into the chimney, which is right about here, the tank weighs over 8,000 pounds. So um, that's too much weight for our fish's transport truck. We have to rent a truck to do this transport. Um, and you need to keep the weight of the truck and all the equipment under 26,000 pounds. So the first time we did this, we actually drove the truck to the Braintree Transfer Center twice to weigh it. <laughs> and we were overweight, so we would go back to Quincy and by siphoning 25 uh, gallons of diesel fuel, taking off the lift gate, eliminating one of those oxygen cylinders, and sending two of the smallest staff members <laughs> who uh, <laughs> didn't eat dinner the night before. We were actually... Um, 90 pounds underweight, so we've done this uh, trip many, many times now, and we have it down to a science, but the first time it was pretty nerve-wracking. So not only um, do you have to set up the truck for the transport, but you, you can't put people in the back of the truck. It's just a regulation, because there's no seats back there. So you can't have someone monitoring the shark while you're underway. So in order to, to be able to operate everything from the cab, we had some airline cables going from the cab back inside the truck, and that was to control dissolved oxygen in the tank. You want to keep it really high. We keep it um, between 100 and 200, or I'm sorry, 160 to 200 percent, and that keeps the sharks in a relaxed state, almost like uh, you know they're they're almost sedated. Um, and then we also had a manifold in the cab so you could control the amount of oxygen you were delivering. And then we had our dissolved oxygen meter in the cab so you could, you know, where your DO was and you could increase it or decrease it. And then we also attached a camera to the window of the tank and fed the cable to my laptop, which was sitting on the co-pilot's lap, and she could view the sharks while we were driving. And once we get to the loading dock at the aquarium, we remove the baffle from the tank, and that's a good shot of the tank. You can see the water levels up high. And that prevents sloshing while you're um, driving the truck and the sharks aren't exposed to air and they actually don't feel the movement. Um, so it's a nice smooth ride for the sharks. Um, we drain the tank down to about 18 inches of water and then the staff can lower themselves down into the tank and the same rubber net is used 
to collect the sharks initially and the tank is used to take the sharks out of the transport tank. And this is a really um, great example of creativity and ingenuity. This um, floating pen was designed by our giant ocean tank staff and it was a great way to acclimate the sharks and introduce them at the same time to the giant ocean tank. So we would put one in there, go down and get the other out of the truck, put it in with its, its buddy and then um, when they seemed comfortable he just opened the door and they would swim out. Usually one goes first and then the other follows. So this is a shot of the door actually being open and the shark swimming out. So it's a great thing to see. It's a bittersweet moment for me and my team. We've worked really hard with these sharks for sometimes over a year and then to kind of say goodbye to them is hard but it's nice. So um, this is a high-speed video of one of our bonnet heads. Um, it's 500 frames per second and it's slowed down so you can see um, the nuances of shark movement. Um, that's a piece of shrimp on the end, one of their favorite food items. And you can see how they use their head and their large pectoral fins to maneuver and grab the food. This is happening really, really fast. So if you were to watch this without it being slowed down, you wouldn't actually see all that movement. And that's how we feed them, is with the feeding stick. It looks easy, but it was actually pretty hard to get the shark to come in front of the, the, uh, the window and do that. So they're very food motivated. All right, this is our black nose shark. So this is a little different in that there's a target on the stick similar to, to uh, this target. Um, black nose sharks are extremely agile, very quick. Um, this video, it's happening really fast, but in this video you can actually see the shark comes in and it touches the target. That's what it's been trained to do. Um, the ball is out toward the end of the stick which keeps the shark away from the diver's hands and it will come in and touch the target right there and then it turns back around and grabs the food. So target training is important for sharks because once they transition to the giant ocean tank they will get fed by divers and the competition for food, there's so many other fish in there. If you were to just throw the food in, um, other fish would eat it. You wouldn't know whether the shark was eating what you were giving it and we also um, provide shark, uh, vitamins to the shark, so it's important to feed them in a way where you can um, be sure that they're getting the food and the vitamins. And it also brings the shark a little closer to the diver so you can get a, go a good look at it. So, these sharks, well, the black nose were collected by a, a collector that we work with in Florida. And then the bonnet head sharks were from the Georgia Aquarium. We do a lot of trading with other aquariums too. The, the bonnet heads, um, well, other institutions might not dive and feed with them. They might feed them in a different way. And the bonnet heads from Georgia were in a touch tank. And so they were fed from the surface, not, not by divers. So it's just a different feeding strategy. Back to the Penguin Palace. Um, so uh, the, the fishes in the giant ocean tank and the turtles and, and the large animals in the GOT for the renovation went down into the penguin exhibit and the penguins came to Quincy. Um, we fondly called it the Penguin Palace because no expense was spared for, <laughs> for this, um, this holding facility. It cost about $450,000 to set this up. Um, so the penguins arrived in um, I believe it was August of 2012 and they stayed until July of 2013. Um, they had supervised swim time. Um, <laughs> you couldn't just let them swim 24-7 uh, because they'd, they'd get in trouble. Um, so this was for our African penguins and our rockhopper pen penguins. You can see that they're segregated right here. On this side was um, rockhopper penguins and on this side was African penguins. So we had these little floating um, ramps and they could just 
they're called scamper ramps and they could just scamper down, go for a swim, and then they'd have to go back up and then the next group would go in, take a swim, go back up. So um, it worked well, it was a little crowded, but um, it, was, it was a good place to hold them. So another um, animal that we hold in Quincy is the southern stingray, and we also do medical procedures on the southern stingray. Um, uh, we use the kiddie pool as well. Um, one unique thing about this exam is that um, adult female southern stingrays um, can actually have reproductive issues as they get older if they don't go through a regular birthing cycle. So our four southern stingrays are, far, are part of a um, study um, that they're participating in that's actually spearheaded by the uh, Disney Living Seas veterinarian. Um, so every uh, three months they get an exam um, and their reproductive tract is um, examined for potential problems that they might have. So this is one of our biggest southerns that's gone to sleep in the uh, kiddie pool. And when they're quiet, we gently flip them over and we take blood from the pectoral region which is right here, and then we also take it from the base of the tail. Um, Katie is, uh, the, the ray is actually sitting on Katie's lap, or laying on her lap, and um, we have a tube that's also ventilating the ray while it's asleep. We perform ultrasounds, um, looking at the uh, ovaries and uterus, um, as well as the heart, uh, and Julie, our uh, associate vet there, is pointing out some interesting findings. Uh, we also take weights um, while they're under. Um, the biggest southern stingray we have is 68 kilograms, which is about 150 pounds. And then they're recovered back in their holding um, tank in the net, and once uh, swimming around and recovered, they're monitored by staff. So quarantine. Quarantine is probably the, the bulk of our work that we do in Quincy. Um, all new animals coming into the collection have to go through some sort of quarantine, and depending on the animal and the situation, it can be as simple as an observational, 30-day observational period where you don't do anything, you just watch the animal. But other times it could be a really lengthy, involved treatment, like the cow nose raised that we had. It was four to five months of quarantine. So it just depends on, on the situation. Um, Every year, um, we run at least one, but sometimes two, Bahamas collecting trips, where we go down to the Bahamas and we collect fishes for um, various exhibits around the aquarium, but mainly for our giant ocean tank. Um, and in 2013, to get ready for the opening, uh, we ran three con consecutive trips, and we collected over 1,300 fishes that were quarantined in, in Quincy. And this picture is um, one of the tanks that was from that trip. So what we're trying to do with quarantine is to keep um, the clean exhibits in Boston clean and um, keep the parasites in Quincy, scrub them up, get them clean, and then send them to Boston for exhibit. These are just some parasites that sometimes we might see um, in Quincy. Uh, the one on the upper left is probably the most common one. Um, and depending on what they are uh, dictates the uh, treatment or the medication you're going to use. Generally, it's a 30-day quarantine period. Um, when animals first come in, they get an entrance exam from our animal health department, and then they get, go through their quarantine period, which is typically 30 days, and then they get an exit exam um, to make sure that they're clean when they leave. And these are some less common and really creepy, scary-looking uh, parasites. This guy is an anchor worm that was actually found up inside the mouth of a porcupine fish. Um, this is a, a acanthocephalin that was found in the uh, intestinal tract of an animal. And this parasite here is um, unique to bonnethead sharks and it's found only on their gills. Some of these things are harder to eradicate than others. So just some other animals that we've held in Quincy um, was this little guy. Um, he's a northern fur seal. He's a male and he was um, born in Alaska um, in July 2013 and he came to the Animal Care Center in December 2013. When they found him, he was about seven days old and he was found on the front porch of an Alaskan state biologist, so 
we think that someone found him and didn't know what to do with him and left him on the step of someone who could help him. So he ended up coming to Quincy. Um, for a little guy, he had a really big attitude. He was, uh, <laughs> he was um, pretty aggressive, but he was a lot of fun to work with, and he's now up in Boston, is integrated really well with um, our sea lion colony and our other fur seals. His name is Chidak. Um, this is a zebra shark, or um, stegostoma, that was in Quincy for quite some time, and he actually went up to Boston and was on exhibit in the penguin exhibit uh, when the penguins were in Quincy. Um, and he was a great animal to work with. He was um, trained to do a number of different things, and one of them was uh, stretcher training. So for many sharks, to get them to go into a stretcher, you'd actually have to anesthetize them for moving them or doing an exam, but he was actually trained to swim into a stretcher, and um, you didn't have to use any anesthesia on him. He was, he was like a big dog, um, really fun to work with, and he's now at the Mystic Aquarium. Um, we miss him. It's a gr great shark. What did you mean, stretch? Stretcher. It's a stretcher. It's how you move the shark. So it's like a vinyl bag with poles on it, and that's how you move the shark from point A to point B. So one, another thing we're working really hard in Quincy on is uh, um, rearing larval fish. Um, this is a, a school of um, smallmouth grunt that we've been working with over the last nine months. Um, they were hatched at Roger U uh, Williams University by um, Andy Ryan, and they came to our facility when they were um, 23 days uh, post-hatch. That's what DPH stands for. Um, and since then, we've been raising them in Quincy, and it's been very successful. We've raised over 1,400 um, smallmouth grunts. And this is important because this species is um, important to our giant ocean tank collection, and normally we would collect them on our Bahamas trip. But if we're able to rear them in-house, it, it's going to lessen the impacts on wild populations, um, as well as um, limit resor uh, take away from the resources we're putting into that and uh, hopefully make this species be uh, self-sustainable. We've sent a um, hundred uh, smallmouth grunts to um, Albuquerque Aquarium and another hundred to North Carolina Aquarium for their exhibits. So um, we're happy to see that. We're hoping to do more species as well. Shorebirds, so we've done um, some quarantine on shorebirds also. This picture on the left is an American oyster catcher that came from Barnstable, from a, a rehabber in Barnstable. Um, he caused quite a ruckus while he was in Quincy. He's a big bird, and he would actually jump over that barrier that you see there and be running around <laughs> outside the barrier, and he would also um, dislodge this hose from his pool, and he'd come in in the morning, and there'd be a major flood, um, and he'd be standing in the corner over there <laughs> Like, I didn't do it. Um, so he, um, he cleared quarantine, and we tried him uh, in our exhibit up in Boston, but he didn't integrate well with the uh, resident birds there. I think it was probably due to his size. He was much bigger than the birds we had on exhibit. So he's um, now at the Milwaukee County Zoo, and we think he's found uh, love with the female oyster catcher there. So it's a good success story. Where is he? He's right here. He's got a really long orange beak. Yeah, he's a big bird. This guy on the right is a common tern that came to us from Cape Wildcare in East Ham, Mass. Uh, it was found on a beach in Truro, um, could not fly, was malnourished. Um, this bird is now on exhibit up in Boston. Um, it has been banded, and uh, its name is Truro. And then two more birds that we've um, quarantined. The one on the left is Elise Sandpiper. I think that one came from North Carolina. Um, also had a wing injury that deemed it unreleasable. Um, and then the one on the right is a semi-palmated sandpiper, also from Cape Wildcare, with a left wing injury um, and was not able to fly, so not releasable. And both those birds are now on exhibit up in Boston. And we've also um, recently um, acquired some poison dart frogs from Montreal, um, from the Biodome in Montreal. 
We have four different species, eight species of each type. And they actually laid eggs. Um, and we've successfully raised three of the tadpole, tadpoles to adulthood. So it took 80 days to get there. And these are just some of the different stages that they went through. Um, little eggs, then the, the tail. Um, very big, really quite a bit of growth there. And then the tail just starts shrinking. And that happens pretty quickly, actually. And then there's the frog. So that was pretty exciting for us. OK, so rescue and rehabilitation. I don't work um, very closely with those folks down there, but I want to give a big shout out to Yulika, who put these slides together for me. Um, so Quincy is uh, the permanent home to rescue and rehabilitation. And every um, year, starting in October and going through January, um, we have sea turtle uh, stranding season. And this just gives you an idea of what we've been doing the last four years um, with stranded sea turtles. Um, that's our first year. Um, 2012 was an epic record-breaking year for turtles. Um, we had over 242 turtles come into Quincy. 100 of them were loggerheads, which is really, really rare. Um, rescue and Rehabilitation Program um, starts with beach walkers um, that are part of the Audubon Society down on the Cape. Um, and at every high tide, starting in the fall and through the winter, they walk the beaches. And they find these turtles up on the, up on the beach. And they're hypothermic, frostbitten, um, nearly dead. Um, and they bring them to, to the animal care center. And when they first get there, um, their body temperature can be as low as 40 degrees. Um, and they need to be warmed up very slowly in the air. They, we don't put them in water until their body temperature can warm up. So these turtles here on, on this slide are actually in a warming room. If they come in at 50 degrees, the temperature in the room is 50 degrees. And then the next day we'll raise the temperature by 5 degrees and we keep doing that until the turtles are ready to, to be put in water. So it's a very long process. And when you have a, 242 turtles, it's nearly impossible. So once they graduate to water, um, you still have to monitor them. They're still fairly weak and they can actually drown. So we have um, uh, very qualified staff and interns and volunteers monitoring their behavior while they're swimming and they're taking notes on how each turtle is doing. They get a little swimming time and then they get moved back into the crates for the night. And some of the turtles you have to actually assist with the swimming have to hold their head up out of the water and let them just use their flippers and that helps to stimulate their their blood flow and, and get their muscles moving. These are some of the treatments that we do. Um, tank is full of turtles there you can see so in addition to our clinic we have um, mobile clinics set up on the deck um, where people are actually working on each of these turtles. This is the situation board that shows the list of diagnostics that, that are scheduled for the day. Um, and during turtle, uh, busy turtle season, we can be doing as much as 50 to 100 um, blood samples. These are our clinics. So we have um, this woman here is listening to a heart uh, with a Doppler. And this is Christmas. So there's no time off. Uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving tend to be two of our busiest days where turtles are actually coming in on the holidays. Um, this is 2012 when we had all the loggerheads. So this tank typically would be filled with Ridley turtles, which are small. But these are all loggerhead turtles. Um, so they took up a lot of space. And they can also um, be aggressive toward one another. So it makes managing the population hard. These numbers on their carapace is actually just like a, with a, a white pen, it comes off. But the number um, denotes the number of, of the turtle when it came in the door. So we had 242 turtles that year. This is number 238, which is pretty close to 242. And as they recover and, and get healthier, we'll ship them off to other um, rehab centers for release or further treatment. Um, this was just a unique case we had in 2012. You might have heard about it in the news, but we had a leatherback uh, stranding in Truro. Um, live leatherback strandings are really rare. 
Um, this turtle uh, came in fairly thin, but it was still 297 kilograms, which is pretty heavy. Um, leatherback sea turtles don't do well in captivity because they are pelagic, and no matter how big the tank is, they'll rub against the walls and, and injure their, their body. So we put our leatherback on a harness with a leash, and we would <laughs> keep the turtle away from the walls, but that enabled it to get exercise and actually helped it get stronger. This turtle was at our facility for about 42 hours. This is the application of the satellite tag on the turtle before we released it. It's a seal tag, actually, so it's much smaller than a, a typical tag for a um, leatherback. And the battery life was only three months. So we got three months of data out of this animal, but it was, it was still um, something to work on. This is the map of the turtle after we released it. So it left Nantucket Sound. And I can't really blow this up, but when it left the sound, it, it, didn't, um, it didn't meander at all. It just headed straight out, which indicated the turtle was very strong. It swam for quite some time until it got to um, deeper water. Um, and we consider the rehab and release of this turtle a success because when we plotted the, the um, locations of the satellite tag, um, it was doing everything it should have done. It was in the right area, it was at the right water temperature, and it was also in areas where we knew there was um, jellyfish, and that's the, the food item for leatherback turtles. So these are just some other faces of Quincy that are near and dear to my heart. This is a balloon fish. This is a uh, common hog fish, looks like a rooster. This is a honeycomb cowfish. This is an um, angelfish, but don't let that beautiful face fool you. They have a really nasty disposition. <laughs> that's a cow nose ray. They look like they're always smiling. This is a basket star, something we collected in the Bahamas. A cushion star. This is a, a arrow crab. I don't know if you can see him, but those are his eyes right there. Long legs. These are some larval um, blue chromis. That's uh, food in their stomach. And, and some non-marine mammal um, <laughs> types. This is my, um, my team. And this is Shannon, also a member of my team, but came on after that previous picture was taken. Shannon's a real water baby, and any opportunity to get in the water, she gets in there. So this is our cow nose ray mystic. She's our resident cow nose ray who loves to interact with people. So she's sitting on Shannon's head. And this is Dina, our lab manager. And this is part of the film crew, those high-speed videos I showed you, and then a lot of the great um, photos you see here are from Keith Ellen Bogan, which is right, is right here. And of course, we couldn't do it without our volunteers and interns. Um, so these are our current balls and interns right now. So if you want more information about some of the things you saw tonight, you can go on our website. Um, and we have some blogs there that are um, specific to some of the things I talked about. Marine Animal Rescue is the rehab program. Uh, mammal Trainers, you could talk, see it, um, about Cheetah on there, penguins. Expedition Blog talks about Bahamas trips, so some of the collecting trips that I mentioned there are also on the website. And if you want more information on sea turtle tracking, you can go to uh, seaturtle.org. So thank you for coming. And